Sorry. We, um, we work with living artists, and I spent my whole career working with living artists. I worked with one dead artist once, and I will never do that again. No. Uh, but yeah, um, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for everyone to manage creatives. It's also not for, ev not for everyone to be one. You know, I've only known one person in my life that attempted to live, more, I would say, fully as an artist outside of systems. And, I mean, he was a jack of all trades. He could do everything. He was a licensed electrician. He was a carpenter. He was a taxi driver. He could pilot boats. He was great at fixing up houses. He was a designer. He was a good speaker. He was a good problem solver. Like a tr He chased all the rats out of the McGill campus at one point. That was one of his jobs. Does he speak French? He does. He does. <laughs> Give him my card. <laughs> yeah, well, and he's, he's also a very accomplished artist, but, but, and he was the best at that and great at social networking, you know, but even him, he, he, he had to be dancing all the time to, to monetize his, his capabilities, with even with those, that multi-dimensional array of skills. So it's very hard to be an artist and, and to survive over any reasonable period of time. What's wrong with our social structure? Well, well first of all, are creative people common? Uh, are there a lot of them? Is this a problem we need to sh solve to find a way to integrate them and to, ex well, I don't want to say exploit them, mm -hmm. but exploit their creativity mm -hmm. for the greater good? Oh. Uh, we don't seem to be very good at that. We, we've marginalized them. There's no minimum wage for visual artists, for example. No, we do an abysmal we, job of Can it. we fix this, our communities? Well, the, the, our... the correlation between grades and creativity in university, at the University of Toronto, for example, is zero, right? But that's because it's not that easy to grade people who are creative. But like, so educational institutions do an, a great job, especially at, at before the university level, of just crushing creative people. So, because the education system was actually set up back in the late 1900s to train the children of workers to be obedient workers. I mean, you think, think all the desks are lined up in a row, you're supposed to sit down, you're supposed to shut up, you're supposed to do what you're told, you do things by the bell, that's a factory bell that rings for recess and so forth. They're factories. You don't produce creative people in factories. You produce factory workers, and that's fine, except there aren't any factory workers anymore, so we should um, probably stop doing it. I'm not sure so things have changed. They haven't changed at all. Things haven't changed very much. No, no, and it's, it's it, you know, it, it's, it's hard. You were asking about the commonality of creativity, too, and the other thing that's difficult and horrible is that creative people are as rare as the winners of races. You know, no matter how many people who are, are racing, there's only one winner. Yeah, well, and, and everything tends to go to the winner, and that's how things work in the world. And the thing about being creative is that it isn't that you have to be creative, it's that you have to be more creative than everyone else. And good luck with that, especially in, in an era where creativity is distributed unbelievably widely on platforms like the, the Internet. Now, I read the other day, and I probably got this figure wrong, but the orders of magnitude are approximately correct. 80 million songs are available for download online. 70 million of them get downloaded zero times, right? Which is, and that's typical of creative production, right? I mean, most, the number of symphonies that most of you people have written is zero, right? The number of books you've published is zero. The, the number of books you will publish is zero. If you publish a book, the probability that it will be, that it will sell more than 100,000 copies is zero, right? The, the rejection rate for a good scientific paper is 99%. So, so it's, very, it's very, very difficult to, to be creative because you have to get there first. And then even if you do get there, very few people take all of the rewards. You, like you think about Stephen King, for example, right? He's a really good example. It's like half the money in the publishing business goes to Stephen King. And the reason, well, here's why, here's why. You know, you go into, think about where people buy books, novels. It's in, it's in airports often. And so then you imagine that the geographical territory for the distribution of novels is something like the book rack in front of the bookstores in an airport bookstore, right? So it's this rack that's this big. Number one position, that's worth God only knows how much. Number two position is worth half that. Number three position is worth half that. And by the time you get down to number 50 position, well, you're not doing anywhere near as well as number one, but you're doing way better than all the other people who are getting zero. And that piece of geographic real estate is replicated at every airport all over the world. And so that one number one slot, man, that's where all the money goes. It's like the 1% of the people who have 50% of the money. And the 1% of them that have 50% of that money. And the 1% of them yeah. that have 50% of that money. The winner takes all. And that's particularly true in a creative domain. The winner takes all. And most so, people stack up at zero. So, it's really rough. So creative people are getting a really rough 
they're not getting a break at all. Um, and there are probably more creative people doing non-creative work in the workforce than the other way around. Oh, definitely, definitely. And you know, the thing is, I don't want to paint too dismal a picture about being creative, because one of the things that pays off big for creative people is that they get to be creative, right? There's great <laughs> aesthetic joy in that, in depth. And I've been privileged because I've worked with more creative people than, than, um, than would fall to the lot, let's say, of the typical psychotherapist, because people often come and see me because they've watched my videos online, and, and they deal with people who are interested in those subjects tend to be creative. And one of the things I've really been struck by, uh, first of all, I've learned that, for those of you who are interested in such things, that the reason Jungian psychology works is because it works for creative people. It doesn't work at all for non-creative people. It just falls dead and flat for them. They're, they're not interested in it at all. It isn't how they think. You mean as therapy? Yeah, oh. that, it, doesn't match, it doesn't match their personalities. Whereas creative people, man, they dream archetypal dreams all the time. It's really interesting. And also, they die if they're, if they're not being creative. They wither on the vine. And I had one client. I really liked him. He was, he was a brilliant architect. And uh, his rational mind was his worst enemy because it just criticized everything. He was hyper-rational, criticized everything, and, and really in a dark way, and effectively, you know. Is if I could get him to not think and just create, he was a complete genius. He, he could, that's where all of the vitality in his life was, you know, that's where the sap rose up mm -hmm. inside the dead tree that was sort of embedded inside of him. And it's very common with creative people is that it's their lifeblood, and it really is from a biological perspective. This isn't some epiphenomena, it's, it's, it's built right into people and deeply. Well, this is something that those of us who work in art museums and work with living artists and contemporary art, uh, and if I have any contemporary curators in, in the audience, they'll know what I'm talking about. This is a drama that we, we live on a regular basis. Uh, the number one uh, is barely affordable, but yeah. you're, you're working with people who are absolutely brilliant, but there's no way for them to monetize their brilliance. They're productive. Uh, they're making wonderful art. The experts love it. The market's not interested. And they're having a hard time. You can't support them by buying everything they make. You're a public institution. You're building a collection that's going to be useful for the future. So you can't put all your money on the poor ones. But the poor ones are every bit as brilliant as the really, really successful ones yeah. from our objective point of view. So this is a problem that I have. And yeah. we produce these people in our art schools. Uh, we've got very good art schools in Canada. So there's a population uh, of artists who are coming out of our art schools who, as a society, we cannot support. We can only yeah. support a very tiny fraction. So for, in, for me, the solution is we need creative people in other professions. Can they be consultants to help other professions be successful? Well, if, you, you know, if you're a business and you're, and you're facing problems that you don't know how to solve, it's creative people that you want to that you want to consult with because they will think laterally. I mean, you, you asked about the psychometric definition of creativity earlier. I mean, imagine that people, it's a very complicated concept to get across properly, but um, you know, if you think about musical genres, you can imagine that there are people who work very well within a tight musical genre. 